So there are these light sensitive proteins in nature. Many researchers kind of had this idea that we could take these light sensitive proteins, clone the gene and make something light responsive. Neurons use electrochemical gradients. You could then use light, these light sensitive proteins, and then you can figure out neuronal circuits. So I was working on heart attack and stroke models, the underlying biology, and there's lots of evidence that changes in mitochondrial charge have a real effect on how the brain or heart can recover from a stroke. There's this phenomenon in animals and humans that you can give the heart or the brain a little bit of hypoxia before a heart attack and stroke, and it prepares the organ for like to adapt. And that's when I started to think, well, that's interesting because young adults don't have heart attacks and strokes by and large. So is this pathway going to be relevant? It was a moment of like, this is real yeah. stuff. This yeah. isn't textbooks and articles. I think there's so much potential for this scientifically. My name is Matt Kaberlein, and welcome to the Optispan YouTube channel. Hey everyone, welcome to the Optispan podcast. Today I am joined by Dr. Brandon Berry. So uh, Brandon was a postdoc uh, in my laboratory for a couple of years and now has moved on to a top secret mission that he is actually, believe it or not, not allowed to tell you about. So um, we will not talk directly about what Brandon is doing these days, uh, but uh, it's it's uh, it's very mysterious to say the least. So um, we'll just leave it at that. What we are gonna talk about is uh, uh, mitochondria. So Brandon has had, uh, I think, a long-term interest in mitochondria. And optogenetics, which is something we haven't talked about before on the Optispan podcast. So we'll dive into what that technology is and the pairing of optogenetics with mitochondria and the relevance for aging that um, made up a large part of uh, Brandon's research. So Brandon got his PhD in 2020 from the University of Rochester, where he did his thesis work with Andrew Witovich, uh, looking at mitochondrial energetics. And I think um, we'll get into it, but I think that's kind of where you first develop your interest in aging and the role of mitochondria in aging, and then came to the University of Washington in 2021 for postdoctoral uh, training in my laboratory, really to focus on the role of mitochondria in aging biology, um, uh, and then had a couple of productive years in the lab, um, I, which, I mean, especially given the time frame, that was right around uh, the tail end of COVID, so Still, I think a lot of inefficiencies associated with that whole experience that we all went through. Um, and then uh, probably about a little bit more than a year in the lab was when I announced that I was going to be transitioning out of academia to my um, new career. So uh, so it was sort of a chaotic time, but even still um, did a lot. And so I want to talk quite a bit about some of the research that that you did during that time. And, and like I said, we won't talk at all about what you're doing now because um, well, you'd have to kill me if I did, so we won't do that. All right. So, anyways, welcome, Brandon. It's great to have you here. Um, let's let's dive uh, right in. So, I, I, you can decide if you want to talk about it or not. Um, I'm sort of interested, and I think you know some of the a lot of people who watch the podcast are in science. Probably a lot of graduate students, postdocs. Um, if you are comfortable talking about kind of your thought process as you were going through the the process of as a postdoc considering applying for, and I know you even applied for some academic faculty positions, the sort of academia versus other options. What was sort of that process like for you? Yeah, yeah. So I came at it from from the beginning of grad school. You know, I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to run my own lab. I wanted to publish research on mitochondria and mitochondrian aging. Um, so that was the goal. And then during the postdoc, um, like you said, it was a chaotic time. COVID was happening. Um, and really what happened, the main driver for me was falling in love with Seattle and just everything about being in Seattle and being at the University of Washington. I really liked it. Um, but I was still I was applying far and wide in academia and all of the places that seemed um amenable to having a lab on the topics that I wanted to study were places not in Seattle. Yeah. Um, so a big factor was just the, the mobility and the kind of the personal choice to decide to pivot from there. Um, and I think that's a very academic thing that you're expected to 
move around um, and get your training from different places and then have your lab in a different place, um, which it makes sense based on um, the diversity of training you need to run a lab today. Um, you do need that diversity of experience and that happens in many different places. Um, so I understood that, but when it came down to it, um, I really just had to make the decision it's it's Seattle or it's something else. Um, so that's when I started looking into other options and that's kind of where it developed. So um, in retrospect, I, I loved all the science that I did. I still love the topic, but I don't feel like it, it's not a regret. I don't really yeah. think about it anymore. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's uh, probably not an uncommon experience. Probably a lot of people who are watching this who haven't been in academia don't really understand that um, it's really not realistic when you're trying to go from being a, a postdoc to a faculty member to constrain yourself geographically. Like you have very little control over where the jobs are gonna be. It's so competitive. You typically you know, will apply broadly and don't have a lot of control over geographically where you're gonna end up. I think a lot of people experience what you do where they just, they don't wanna be at the whim of where they can get a job. And so that's one of the many reasons I think that often contribute to people kind of leaving the academic path and, and going other directions. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I think there's there are many problems with the academic system, and that's just one, but um, not uncommon, I, I don't think. And I know, I know that wasn't the only thing that factored in, but, you know, it's it can be a major component of why people choose to leave academia and go in other, other directions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think everyone who runs a lab loves what they do so much and you're willing to sacrifice kind of a lot for that, which which is great. But then, um, you know, as academia is very constrained industry, academia, everything is constrained by different things. And the constraints in academia are such that you really have to love what you're doing where you are. Um, so it, it is just like a calculation of what do I really want to be doing and where can I get that? So I, in the postdoc, I really started to think, what do I want to do unless what kind of lab do I want to have or what kind of industry do I want to be in? It's more just what do I want to do? And then what are the things that fulfill that? And that was a much healthier way to think about it. And then it made it easy of like, yeah, I don't need my own lab. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I know you can't tell us what you're doing right now, which is unfortunate. Maybe at some point in the future, you'll be um, off of this current mission and able to talk about that. So let's talk about mitochondria. So I, probably everybody watching this is familiar with the idea that mitochondrial dysfunction is one of the hallmarks of aging. And, and you know, mitochondria are clearly central to the aging process. But I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think your interest in mitochondria developed through the lens of aging. If anything, it might be the reverse. So maybe talk about how you first got interested in in mitochondria and and maybe even start from sort of a very, you know, general introduction of what mitochondria are just for some of the people who maybe aren't aren't quite up to speed on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I developed my interest in mitochondria in college, actually. Um, so mitochondria are these amazing organelles. They're little... Uh, living things inside of our cells. They're evolutionarily ancient. They came from organisms that were free living uh, billions of years ago, and they got engulfed by a bigger cell. And what these um, tiny organelles do is produce ATP, which is the cellular energy currency. So it was very beneficial for these organisms to join forces, and it allowed... Um, cells to have bigger genomes, it allowed eukaryotes to evolve. Um, so complex life is, uh, any complex life you find has mitochondria for the most part. Um, so for a long time, mitochondria were thought of as these ATP factories. They just put out energy and that's what mitochondria are. Powerhouses of the cell. Powerhouses of the cell, <laughs> that's it. Um, so that's true. They are powerhouses of the cell. It's a big deal. It's important for what mitochondria are, but they're also, they've evolved with life for so long that they've taken on other roles. Most of the mitochondrial genome got transplanted into the eukaryotic nucleus. Um, so now mitochondria are dependent on the cell and the cell is dependent on mitochondria. Um, so in college, I took a cell biology lab and, you know, had learned all of the functions of mitochondria, how they convert 
food energy into an electrical energy into a chemical energy that the cell can use. So you learn all of this theory. And then in this lab, uh, we isolated mitochondria from the cells of cauliflower. Hmm. So we, Why cauliflower? I don't, I think because it was abundant and it Cheap. was a college lab, <laughs> yeah. so they didn't want you killing anything. Okay. Um, but it was very cool that you start with this whitish vegetable and you shaved the very tips of the, of the cauliflower off and you put them through this process to isolate the mitochondria and it turned red. So this white hmm. substance turned red and that is the chromophores in mitochondria. So I thought, wow, that's, you know, mitochondria are really in there. And then you measure the oxygen consumption. So the air that we breathe has oxygen. Mitochondria use that um, as part of the process of the ATP making through respiration. Um, so we put them in a, a device that measures oxygen concentration. You put them in and you give them food to respire and you saw the oxygen concentration start to drop. And it was a moment of like, this is real yeah. stuff. Yeah. This isn't textbooks and articles. This is mitochondria are in these cells. Um, so I was kind of hooked from there. Um, so decided to go to grad school. Um, did, yep, did my PhD with Andrew Wotovich, uh, mitochondria lab, um, who develops very cool optical techniques to control mitochondrial function. And it was really toward the end of graduate school that I got interested in mitochondria and aging, really because my PhD is in physiology. So everything that I was doing was animal organ related and it turned out that a lot of the interventions we were using and questions we were interested in had to be done at certain pretty early ages for experiments to quote unquote work mm. so i started to think why don't things work when the animals are older something is fundamentally different about the aged state um so then, you know, reading about aging, seeing mitochondrial dysfunction is a hallmark of aging. It was kind of obvious for me to say, we want to, I was studying heart attack and stroke at the time, the biology underlying heart attack and stroke. These things happen in older people. They, they're not happening in young animals. Um, so I thought it was pretty important to understand the aging biology and how mitochondria fit into um, those diseases at the the correct age. Yeah. And that's, that's what brought me to you. Cool. Yeah, no, that's great. And, uh, I mean, you mentioned that Andrew's lab at the time was developing these tools to control mitochondria using light. So a little bit harder question then, I don't know if it's harder, maybe a little bit harder to explain, uh, in a way that I can understand is so if, so we talked about mitochondria, so the tools are fall into this class of optogenetics, right? right? So can you just kind of explain more broadly what that term means? And then we'll talk about sort of the melding of mitochondria with optogenetics. Yeah. yeah so optogenetics, I think of it as this diverse toolbox um, that scientists use. Opto from light and genetics from genes. Um, and the field of neuroscience really popularized what optogenetics is today. So there are these light sensitive proteins in nature. Um, the most popular one is a protein called channel rhodopsin. Um, it's a channel that's in a biologic membrane where in response to light, this channel will open and let ions flow across membranes. So um, many researchers kind of had this idea that we could take these light sensitive proteins from many different organisms, clone the gene, and put it into your favorite organism and make something light responsive. So the obvious idea is neurons use electrochemical gradients to signal to each other. And you could then use light, these light sensitive proteins to alter the electrochemical gradients on neurons, alter how these neurons talk to each other, and then you can figure out neuronal circuits using light. So maybe it's worth just taking a second. I know you kind of, you kind of alluded to this, but I mean, what is the normal function of these proteins and why are they light sensitive? Yeah, so there are many, many functions of them. The ones that I'm most familiar with are for chemotaxis. So there are algaes and different kind of single-celled organisms yeah. that will need to sense where light is. Yeah. And they'll use these proteins to move toward light or move away from so light. The idea, is that the idea is that, you know, the proteins absorb the light, they change conformation, and if they're channel proteins, that then changes the flow of something across the yep. membrane, ions, presumably. And they use that to then um, understand where the light is so that the organism can move towards the light. Go toward the light, photosynthesize. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, so that makes sense 
that that's the normal function of these things. And then what people do is develop technologies where you take those proteins and put them into a different context to harness that function for what you want it to do. Right, right. Yeah, you're kind of hijacking the function to do some other thing yeah. um, that is really just about the core function of what this protein is doing, but it's doing something very different in a mouse brain than it right. is for this uh, algae swimming around. Right. So so what are the kinds of things that you would use that for in, in the brain from a research perspective? Yeah, so from a, a research perspective, what you can do is express these proteins using genetic promoters in different cell types. And that lets you answer questions in a living animal so a living mouse for example you can put a fiber optic into the brain and you know this light sensitive protein is only in say dopaminergic neurons and you can turn those neurons off by turning the light on so you can ask the question are dopaminergic neurons important for this mouse behavior or xyz and what does that mean to turn the neurons off so what you can do is depolarize okay. or polarize so again you're using this channel protein to in response to light move ions one way or the other right and that turns on or off i guess crudely speaking the right. function of that cell right okay yeah so then i think i don't think you guys were the first to do this but people then also developed these optogenetic tools in the context of mitochondria that's right yep and so tell us about those specific tools yes so this uh was a project that was you know unfunded just idea that um Andrew had. When so I this was done lab. first in Andrew's lab. He was no, it was not done first. But so the the history of it is in the '90s, someone took one of these proteins from a bacteria called Bacteria rhodopsin. So this is a small protein that was light responsive, and in response to light, it would pump protons, so positively charged hydrogen ions, mm -hmm. across a membrane unidirectionally in a certain direction, depending on how the protein was oriented. So this was used in neuroscience as well. And um, someone took this protein, put it into yeast mitochondria, Schizosaccharomyces pombi. Um, so they put it into mitochondria in order to charge the mitochondrial membrane. So I'm going to take a step back to explain this aspect of uh, mitochondrial function. So how mitochondria make the ATP is through an electrochemical gradient. Right. So there's energy present in food that we eat, we digest the metabolites, they end up in mitochondria and electrons get passed through like a wire um, in the mitochondrial membrane. And some of the energy from these electron transfers is used to pump protons from inside the mitochondria to outside and it develops a charge, positive, negative, uh, across the membrane. And then there's other proteins in the mitochondrial membrane that will use that gradient. It will let the protons come back into the mitochondria and that dissipation of energy, some of it is used to make ATP from ADP that is available. Right. And I know you've used the battery analogy, so maybe yeah. this is a good time to just kind of introduce this idea. Yes. Basically, you're using carbon metabolism to charge the battery, right, right. in a sense, and then you're using that potential to create ATP, which is right. the currency, energy currency that the cell uses for its chemical reactions. Right. Yes. Yep. So th that's the battery analogy. If people are into electronics, they'll say it's more like a capacitor. <laughs> um, so yes, it's okay. more like a capacitor, um, but battery's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that that's what's happening. And so, so what you can do with these proteins in principle is with light, charge or reduce the charge on the battery right. by pumping protons. And you, based on the orientation you put it in, you can control whether the protons are going out or in. Right, right, right. Yep. So yes, one direction pumping out is the same way that mitochondria would normally do it, except the energy is from the light. Right, you don't have to burn carbon to do it. And, yeah. yeah, and yeah. not a carbon source, right. Yes, so this paper in the 90s did this. They put a bacteria rhodopsin molecule, that light-sensitive proton pump, they put it in mitochondria and they showed some very tangential evidence that this seemed to charge the mitochondria. They didn't, there weren't really good methods um, available at the time to really test um, the measuring the charge in these yeast. Um, but they had other things like they looked at the glucose requirement, uh, things that are metabolically associated with mitochondrial function. And they looked at pH changes. 
It turns out the pH, which is all based on uh, protons and hydrogen, um, the pH component of this gradient is quite small, and the results that they got were quite small results. It was almost, you know, it was kind of maybe there's an effect, maybe there's not, and it's because that the, the pH measurement is not, um, doesn't have a huge dynamic range. So there's an indication that this seems to be photoactive mitochondria in this in these yeast. And then nothing came of it in the literature for a long time. Why do you think that is? I have thoughts about why that is. And I think it's because um, the mitochondrial membrane potential, this charge gradient, is evolutionarily ancient, extremely important for life <laughs> to have energy. If you lose your mitochondrial function, you die yeah. very fast. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So this is extremely homeostatic. There are mechanisms in place, some that we know and some that we don't fully understand, that keep your mitochondria charged to the right amount. There's, If it gets too high, bad things happen. If it gets too low, bad things happen. So it's very homeostatic. Um, and so I think it's there are mechanisms in place when you try to turn it up, homeostasis takes over and tries to not mm -hmm. get it turned up too much. Yeah. Just like a capacitor, you charge it too much and you get dielectric breakdown and mitochondria explode. <laughs> um, so I think, and, and we saw that as well when I first did this. So we use this same approach. Instead of using bacteria rhodopsin, we used a very closely related protein from a eukaryotic organism because we thought we're using eukaryotes. Maybe a eukaryotic uh, proton pump would maybe function better we had no real data to suggest that but we just thought let's use this one it was a popular neuroscience protein it's called um, leptospheria maculins is the organism it's from proton pump was called mac um so we after a lot of trying got this um gene expressed in mitochondria and was this in yeast still? no no this this was in c elegance okay so you so, so you so you guys let me just make sure I get this right. So there was this old literature from 10, 15 years ago where people had shown proof of principle that you could, using an optogenetic tool, uh, move protons uh, in mitochondria, right? right? Either direction, charge yep. or uncharge the battery. And then it just sort of, nobody worked on it for a while, as far as you know, or at least it didn't get published. Meanwhile, the neuroscience field had continued to develop these tools for other uses, right. not mitochondria for, for, you know, sort of moving molecules across the probably the plasma membrane of right. neurons um and so you guys then decided okay there's this proof of principle that this can be done we're we want to we want to engineer this but rather than use yeast you worked in c elegans which is a multicellular nematode uh worm commonly used model organism we'll talk a little bit about why there's plenty of advantages there from this perspective probably the big advantage is they're transparent so you knew that you could do the light part of it right? exactly yep um uh but you thought to yourself okay rather than use this bacterial protein let's use a protein from a eukaryote i guess we haven't defined that most people listening will probably know this but just in case um so there are bacteria which don't have mitochondria they're the sort of most rudimentary form of life and then um, everything sort of from yeast on up the evolutionary ladder, what's called eukaryotes, do have mitochondria. Right. And there's a bunch of differences, basically, um, between between bacterial species and eukaryotes. And so it made sense that taking a eukaryotic protein that's light sensitive would potentially make it more likely to work. I think that's yes. probably the thought yes. process, right? There are a bunch intuition. of reasons why that might be the case, but you probably thought this is more likely to work if we use a eukaryotic protein in another eukaryotic organism. Right. So then you yep. put this into C. elegans mitochondria, yes. and I'm guessing it took a long time to get it to work. It took a very long time yeah. to get it to work. Um, it's kind of compounding difficulties where we first, like we went to this older paper and we said, let's do it just like they did it. We use the same mitochondrial targeting sequence. So there's a piece of a gene that normally goes to mitochondria. You can cut that piece off, put it on the front of this light sensitive protein to tell it to go into mitochondria. It seemed to work great for them. It did yeah, not. Let, let's, let's just make sure so that again, it, I know we're getting, this is going to be a pretty in the weeds episode here. So, um, it's sort of like a, a, a zip code signal. Maybe that's a way to yeah. say it, right? So proteins that are that are meant to end up in the mitochondria, again, just, just to take everybody from the top down, 
the proteins that with with a few exceptions, the proteins in our cells are are uh, they come from the DNA and the nucleus. They get um, made into RNA and then the RNA converted into protein in the cytoplasm. But then some of those proteins have to get to the nucleus. Some of them have to get to the mitochondria. Some of them go other places. There are these zip code targeting sequences that help the cell understand where to put these proteins when they're made. That's right. And so mitochondria have this mitochondrial targeting sequence. It's pretty similar across eukaryotes, some differences from, from species to species, but uh, you knew you wanted this protein to end up in the mitochondrial membrane, so you put this targeting zip code sequence on there. You engineered it into the construct in the hopes that that would then tell the cell, once you make it into a protein, send it to the mitochondria. Right. Yep. That's right. Okay. Yes. So we tried the exact sequence that these people in the 90s used. We fused it, that part, onto this new protein. Didn't end up in mitochondria at all. We just didn't see it there. Um, so what we did after that, we did a lot of things, and I'm probably going to get the order of what we tried wrong, and I don't even need to go into it. We tried many others. Now, were others. you in the lab at this time? Or yeah, was this? yeah, okay. yeah. So this was, I, this project was, like I said, not funded, and I was a rotation student, and Andrew kind of said, figure this out. And I did. <laughs> It just took a long time. And was this the first time anybody had used? It was the first time anybody had used the mitochondrial optogenetics since this these nineteen nineties papers yeah. that you know of at least. Yeah, yeah. And then so we can talk about as I was working on it, some other things were popping up. So people have had been thinking about this and and also trying to do it. Okay. Um. So there were a couple of papers that came out while I was still working on it in worms, and these uh, papers were in cells. So. It, Really, it took so long to get this targeting aspect to work. We were close to saying, maybe this isn't really worth it. Yeah. And then we saw some other papers come up that seemed to get it to work in cells. And we we're like, okay, and these are human we're going to do it. Um, one of them was in human cells, yes. Um, and yeah, they're both. They're both in human cells. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And just just so that I guess people can understand this a little better, then this the neuroscience studies... Those were were those done in in neuronal cultures or were they done in in brain? And I'm guessing if they were done in brain, it had to be these sort of probably kind of gross experiments where there's no skull, right? Because again, what I'm you know we talked about C. elegans are transparent, right? right? If this is an optogenetic system, if even if you expressed these optogenetic proteins in your brain, the light's not going to get there, right? So how yeah. was that done? So yeah, originally it was neurons in culture and yeah. cells in culture uh, for proof of principle. But then pretty rapidly, this was happening in mice. And how they do it is drill a tiny hole and put a fiber optic cable. And ah, there are and many, many ways. Yeah, so you can shine, yeah, the, so light you can shine right the light in a specific brain region Got it. and target um, yeah, different specific things like that. It. Yeah. But it's just worth keeping in mind because I'm sure, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the maybe more sci-fi aspects of this, right? But, you know, could you create an animal or a person, right, where you express one of these things? And in principle, you could, but it would really only be the skin where you would actually get the activity unless you do something like that to allow the right. to get in. Yeah. That's why worms are great because being transparent, you can really put it anywhere in the worm that you want to and have the optogenetic effect right okay right sorry it's a little bit of a tangent but worth yeah yeah sure yes definitely definitely it's a little worth bit of it. a nuance that's probably important yeah and i'll also say um also worth discussing is why do we want to do this because it's very cool yes yeah. but uh <laughs> the big reason to want to do this is because like i was saying um the mitochondrial charge is so homeostatic there were no good tools to actually study this in vivo right all the ways to measure it and manipulate it are kind of um, tangential to metabolism itself. So if you want to charge the battery, turn up the charge, you would have to fuel upstream metabolism, give more electrons, more carbon source. Right. Metabolism is very complicated. And if, if you're adding that, you're changing Whole thousands of, of other variables. Yeah. And so with a technique like this, you're changing one variable, yeah. which is very attractive. Yeah. Um, and this is actually also an important nuance is the way other people get around that is they purify the mitochondria out of the cells, out of the organism, and then study, you know, the, the, the mitochondria, isolated mitochondria, right. where you can control the inputs, right? Yeah. The, the substrates that are being put in very precisely, 
So you don't have all that metabolic complexity upstream, right. but you lose all of the interaction of the mitochondria with the rest of the cell. Right. And so that's this, all that metabolic yeah, complexity. Yeah, which is super important too, right? Yeah. So so this is a this is a way in principle where you can in an experimental way precisely control the um uh, charge of the battery for, for just right. lack of a better way of saying it, uh, in a very specific way without having to change a thousand other variables at the same right. time. Right. Yes. Yep. And why we wanted to do that was because we, we know it's important for everything, basically, you know, every action that a cell takes needs energy and yeah. most of that energy comes from mitochondria. Why specifically I was interested in it is because I was working on, heart attack and stroke models, the underlying biology. And there are lots of evidence that changes in mitochondrial charge have a real effect on how the brain or heart can recover from a stroke. And if we just had some way to isolate this variable, we could start asking questions about that. So that's why we developed the tools initially. And that's why the American Heart Association um, wanted to pay me to do that. Um, so that, that's kind of the context of why, and it's not just that this is very cool, which it is still very cool, but um, right. So, so after many years of slogging, you eventually got it to work. Yes, we got it to work. <laughs> and so we got both versions. We got the turning on version yeah. and the turning off version. And you guys call those mito on and mito off. Mito on and mito okay. off. Yes, the, the mitochondrial light switches uh, was our idea. Um, and... It took me a while to get into the mito off tool because we were very excited about the mito on because there are some drugs and things that you can do to decharge mitochondria. Right. So you can study that a with a little bit more precision. So we were very excited about let's do the thing that is really hard to do. It was really hard to do for us also um, because of, again, this homeostatic nature of if the charge gets too high, bad things happen. So at first, we didn't really know if it was working or doing anything. So one of the first experiments we did was isolate the mitochondria, make sure that it was in the mitochondria, it was there, and is it functional? So the first thing was measure the gradient, like measure that charge. And we were able to do that under careful experimental conditions with isolated mitochondria controlling the inputs and the outputs. Um, and it, it seemed to work. You would give it light and you could see that you had an increased charge and then you would use these pharmacologic tools to decrease the, right. the charge and we would see it go down even though we gave no substrate to the mitochondria. And just because some people may have heard of these um, drugs, what are some of the drugs that depolarize the mitochondria? Yeah, so some of these drugs are uh, dinitrophenol, yep. DNP. Yeah. Um, Famous weight loss drug, right? Right. Yes. I think the reason the FDA was created was because DNA, <laughs> the DNP was killing people. Um, yeah. So, you know, you decharge mitochondria. Yeah, but it works dangerous. for weight loss as long as you don't <laughs> it push does. it too far, right? Yeah. Right. Right. And and the reason that is because you're you're decharging the, the mitochondria and the mitochondria will respond through homeostasis and say, we need this gradient. And it will try to make the gradient by burning through all of your fat stores. Right. And if you ha take too much of it, it burns through all of your everything stores right. and you can't breathe. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so that's one. Yes. DNP, dinitrophenol. Yep. Dinitrophenol, FCCP, which has a really long yeah, name we'll that just I don't know. With FCC. And CCCP, a very similar molecule. And now there's like a whole host of many molecules that people call them mitochondrial uncouplers. Right. Because it uncouples this gradient from the oxygen consumption and right. the, the And people source. may have heard of uncoupling proteins. Those are proteins that that are expressed in different cells or different animals have different types right. of uncoupling proteins that do the same thing, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. They, they do the same thing in a regulated way right. that can't be too much. Right. Um, right. Okay. So we, so we use these tools to test the new tool of charging up the mitochondria. And what we quickly learned is that we had the idea, like, let's supercharge the mitochondria. Let's see if we can get it to go too high. Will it like, kill the animals? Like, will we get a crazy high charge and isolated mitochondria? What will happen? And really under those kind of conditions, like nothing happened. Hmm. And we were thinking like, is it, does it not work? Is it not folded correctly? Like what could be going on? But then we did the experiment where you can inhibit the mitochondrial, the normal machinery that's normally making the gradient. You can get the gradient to come down a little bit. Then mito on 
will respond to that and bring it back up, interestingly, to close to where it would normally be under fully fed conditions, but not over. So there's some mechanism that prevents the charge from getting too high. Yes. Do you know what that is? Do we know what that is? I think we have some ideas. So in our, how I did the experiments, I don't know specifically what was at play, but there are things at play uh, such as just making more ATP, so consuming the gradient faster, mm -hmm. activation of uncoupling proteins. So these proteins can be thought of in some context as a release valve Got on it. the charge. Yeah. So they might be getting activated to say, like, let's turn it down a little bit. Um, and then there's there are a bunch of other metabolic factors like the TCA cycle could slow down, which is the process that feeds the mitochondria to make the gradient in the first place. Right. Uh, and there's evidence in a bunch of different contexts that that's how this gradient is maintained. It's different in different contexts and different tissues. Um, so we don't know what was doing that when I was doing the experiments, but these are the options that sure. we know of. Um, so that made it a little bit more complicated to design experiments with using mito on because it really is not going to do anything crazy like the animals weren't sick they didn't immediately die so it was um maybe a little bit less exciting but i think looking back it was not less exciting because a lot of exciting stuff came out of it um so that was about three and a half years of my phd was getting the conditions right to see how this thing worked and there's cofactors you need to use to make sure that this protein is functional, especially when you're using worms. Um, so it was a lot of trying and careful troubleshooting. And the bulk of my PhD was that. And then actually doing the physiology happened pretty quick compared to the um, kind of banging my head against the bench to get it to work. Yeah. I mean, that's often the way it is, right? When you're doing technology development in in biomedical research, it's it's often very hard to predict how long it's going to take, um, how hard it's going to be. And so you can spend a lot of time building the tool. Yep. And then once you've got it, then you can go do the, ex the experiments. Yeah. And it's yeah. pretty quick. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing now. Now that it, it's out there and we have several publications with it, Andrew is, get, is getting people wanting to use it and then seeing... <laughs> what it takes to control for it yeah. is more than you bargained for. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things also that often, especially with a system like this, that it sounds like it's, it's pretty complicated that you build these things, you, you get the, uh, institutional knowledge within the lab for how to do it and how to do it right. And then when you try to export it out more broadly speaking, it's very, it can be very difficult, right? Because there's a lot of, lot of things you have to control for to make it work well. And communicating that to other groups um, is often difficult. And, you know, let's be honest, there are a lot of lazy graduate students out there who won't be careful and won't, and, and it's just, it, it's hard sometimes getting these complex tools to work well yeah. Broadly speaking to the community. Yeah. Yeah. Th like this was my PhD project, but if this was some tool that I just wanted to use in my PhD project, I would maybe spend a few months on it and say this, I don't know if I'm going to do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we want to make it, um, as straightforward as possible to use, but optogenetics is just like that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, we got, we got that working and then so while, while that was coming up, we saw these other papers that were coming out that seemed to be getting mitochondrial optogenetics to work. One of those papers was a different kind of the off version. It was actually using channel rhodopsin, like the most widely used neuroscience um, protein at the time. They got this channel rhodopsin to be expressed the same way in mitochondria using a similar targeting strategy that we used. This was in cells. And this was in cells, cells, in human cells, okay. yep. And they, they were able to do all the metrics same way we were doing to show that it was working in the mitochondria. And they showed that it could alter calcium signaling in cells, which is also very diverse um, signaling that cells do. Um, so we were encouraged that this this could work. Spent all the time on MitoOn. Um, did some nice work for my thesis with MitoOn about... Um, this stroke-ish model um, showing how the mitochondrial charge actually can affect how worms would recover from hypoxia, which is a w how cells respond to hypoxia, which is what happens during a stroke or a heart attack. Um, so 
I made my small contribution there. Mitochondrial charge is important for recovery from low oxygen. It was great. And then we wanted to try the other version. So we turn it up. What about you turn it down? So this other paper had come out showing very nicely that they could turn it down and they got good signaling effects. And pretty much as soon as I started doing the off version, everything was working way faster. Hmm. And I think part of it was that I had just spent three years learning how to do experiments. <laughs> but the other part of it, I think, is that it's a lot easier to turn down a gradient right. than it is to turn it up because you're not fighting against the pressure that's already there. There's already a charge. Um, that's not so it's not so homeostatically regulated to just punch a hole in the membrane and let the ions just come back in. They want to come back in. Um, so using the off version was much faster and easier, which was great because I was able to finish my PhD. <laughs> um, so what did you do? What did you do with it? What were you so we did a similar question um, with Mito on. We showed that turning up the charge during the, the hypoxia, the low oxygens, like during the stroke or heart attack damages the cells. It's bad for them. So that, gave some proof that it is definitively sometimes bad to have your mitochondria turned up when they have no oxygen to do anything with. Okay. We wanted to test the other and direction. Is that, a, is that a reactive oxygen species kind of mechanism there? We think so, and we also think, yes, basically just like the buildup of intermediates. So you have reducing agents building up, you have oxidants that... Are possible well, maybe not reactive oxygen species, but a redox sort of yes. stress yes. mechanism. Yep. And Andrew's lab is still focused on really defining like which species and what is going on. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just had the first membrane potential causes bad things. That was the publication. <laughs> so again, let me get this straight. So you take the worms, you put them into a hypoxic environment. In this That's case, right. is this anoxia like complete absence of oxygen or is it just a very very low amount of oxygen it's a very very low amount of oxygen it's it's much lower a lot of um worm hypoxia studies use like single percent this was like 0 0.001 percent so like very very very, very close low close to anoxia. to anoxia yeah okay so you put them in this very hypoxic environment and if you and so naturally in that condition what happens to the membrane potential Naturally, it comes down. Okay. And what you do is you turn it up with mito on, right. and that causes death? That causes death. Okay. So that suggests that the membrane potential normally coming down is an adaptive thing. Right. The cells know there's no oxygen, so mitochondria turn down. Right. Because we don't want, we're not needed right now. Right. I mean, you might think that it's a just a byproduct of low oxygen, but this suggests there might actually be a benefit to yep. reducing the mitochondrial membrane under those conditions. Yes, that's okay. right. Yep. Okay. So then what happens if you turn it down and put them in hypoxia? Is that protective? Yes. Yes. So turning it down before the hypoxia was actually protective. Like a pre Yes, a preconditioning. So, yeah. Um, and this is also part of the nuts and bolts of what I was studying was this phenomenon of ischemic preconditioning yeah. where there's this phenomenon in animals and humans that you can give the heart or the brain a little bit of hypoxia before a heart attack and stroke. And it prepares the organ for like to adapt. And do you think the mechanism is because when you do that, you turn down the, the mitochondrial membrane? Yes. And we were able to show that in a, using different timelines, um, in the worms. So would an uncoupler do the same thing? An uncoupler does do the same thing, and that was our positive control. Okay. Does that work in stroke models? It does. Yep. <laughs> and that's why we thought um, that we had something on our hands, because we knew the turning down with a drug had some positive Is effects. Is that used clinically at all? No, no. It's not, it's not used clinically because um, it's a very cell-intrinsic mechanism like this is happening in the brain or heart cells uh -huh. and we know that stroke and heart attack in a human are immune and fibrotic and there's all this other stuff going on um so the idea is if we can understand how this intrinsic mitochondrial energetics is working better that a better therapy could be developed Got it. at no point was i ever trying to be like this should be in our hearts and brains so we can condition ourselves it was always to be as a tool to understand how mitochondria are functioning normally and under pathology so we can then better target them 
may, maybe targeting them with optogenetics will happen one day. We can go to a tanning bed and condition ourselves. <laughs> well, but um, I mean, there are like like we talked about, there are uncouplers out there. Now, I mean, obviously yep. there are, they have risks, but you know, I've, I mean, I don't know if anybody's studying DNP in this context, but there are certainly people who are now thinking about low dose DNP for a variety of things. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, and like organ targeted and slow release and yeah. pro drug versions. Yeah. There's a lot of that now, which is a much smarter approach than just taking right. this stuff. Right. Or at least safer. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So yes. That, so that's, in worms though, if you, if you pre treat with mito off, turn, turn down the charge and then you put them in hypoxia, they do better. What do does that better. mean? They survive better? Yes. Yes. Okay. They survive better. So the model we were using is a pretty blunt model of do they live or do they die? And we dialed in the amount of hypoxia and the time that they were in the hypoxia. So we always aim for about half of them to die. Okay. So that way we could see yep. now three quarters die or now yep. three quarters live. Yeah. Um, and that was its own whole set of figuring that out. <laughs> so what's the mechanism? The mechanism of what? The, the the protection. We think part of the mechanism is through this other metabolic protein called AMP kinase, yep. which is kind of a metabolic energy sensor. I often describe this as the the low power mode on your phone when your battery gets low and it says you want to turn on low power mode right. that's amp kinase sensing low energy and it does that through sensing amp which is a breakdown product of atp right and it can shift how metabolism is working to to uh change energy sources right. and so just to give a little bit of context here right so so amp Adenosine monophosphate has one phosphate, ADP diphosphate to ATP triphosphate, three phosphates. And the phosphate bond is sort of the energy currency of the cell. And so the idea is when the mitochondria are making ATP, they are essentially taking the AMP and through these phosphorylation events, turning it into ATP which is a higher energy, higher value currency. Okay, so a, a AMP kinase senses the amount of AMP. So when you turn off the mitochondria with the mito off or bring the charge down, you are going to have less ATP? Yes, in isolated mitochondria, we can show that. In an animal, it's harder to tell because AMPK acts so fast that it restores the, the ATP levels pretty quick. We were able to do a fast experiment and show that in a whole animal under light with mito off, the whole animal ATP level was lower. So yes. However, that can get complicated because there are all these mechanisms to make sure that ATP does not go down. But essentially what happens is when you turn, when you use mito off, AMP kinase gets activated. It's yes. sensing that there's a deficiency of energy yes. and it because there's more AMP, which it is sensing, and that tells the cell we need to we need to do something about this deficiency of energy. Yes. Make more ATP. Yes. So you turn on AMP kinase when you t use mito off. Right. Yep. Okay. And this is interesting from the aging perspective because AMP kinase is a known sort of node in this aging network, yep. right? And in worms, people had shown if you activate AMP kinase, that's sufficient to increase lifespan. And um, again, I know many people listening will have heard of metformin, right? Which is, does a lot. <laughs> um, but one of the things it does is activates AMP kinase, potentially through a similar mechanism, except right. by, by, you know, inhibiting the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. Yep. Um, okay, so just to put that in context, then you... Pre-treat with mito off, activate AMP kinase, and that's necessary for the protection against hypoxia? Is that the idea? It is, um, because we then genetically knocked out AMP kinase, and that protection went away. Is turning up AMP kinase sufficient to protect against hypoxia? I think that we didn't do that, but it's been done. Good and thing I, think, I didn't yes. review your paper, because I would ask for that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, it's been done, Okay, and I think the answer is yes, okay. it is sufficient. Okay, so that's... I mean, that makes a pretty strong case that that you've the, the mechanism here, at least partly, is um, decouple or 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 uh, uncharge the battery, 
turn up AMP kinase, and that turning up of AMP kinase protects against hypoxia. Yeah, yep, okay. that's the idea, and at least in the worm model. So does metformin protect against hypoxia? I don't remember now. I knew at one point because that was when I was doing it, um, but I, I'm not sure. I would predict yes, but uh, it's it's out there. Okay, okay, so... Okay, so you did those experiments, and then at some point, while you were still a graduate student, you started studying this in the context of aging. Yeah. So part of that was um, the Mito on paper that we published. A reviewer asked for a lifespan experiment. It wasn't I, me. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I had never done a lifespan experiment before, ever. I, was, I gave it a shot and got really messy data and we said sorry we can't do that and still got the paper published so that's good but it kind of put the idea in my head and also i was presenting this at conferences and things and worm researchers are you know aging and worms go together very tightly so lots of people would ask me what's the lifespan and i was kind of like i don't know i don't know we were we're interested but haven't done it interested haven't done it we got asked to do it i tried it didn't really do it but what really got me ready to do it was, and do it right and well, was um, these interventions, the hypoxic interventions, I learned that you have to start these experiments very young, when the worms just become adults. If they're any older than that, the interventions don't work anymore. They're not protected by the things that would normally protect them. And that's when I started to think... Well, that's interesting because young adults don't have heart attacks and strokes by yeah, and large. Right. So is this pathway going to be relevant? So you go to the mouse literature, they're also not that old. Yeah. And this is a larger problem in the literature, right? Historically, I mean, not so much in the aging literature, but in almost all of the disease model literature, people will use young animals to study age-related diseases. And, you know, there's this kind of idea out there that mice are a terrible model for human biology because all these drugs work in mice and failed. But that's probably not, at least in my view, but it's certainly not the only reason. And maybe it's not the case that mice are a bad model. It's that young mice are a bad model for old people. Right. Old mice yeah. actually be a, might be a pretty decent model for old people from biology perspective. So what you were saying, I think, is... In your studies, what you observed was that the results you were getting in the hypoxia model in the young worms weren't working the same way in the old worms. And That's that right. suggested there's something interesting. Yes, yeah, some different biology. Yeah. Um, right, yep. So that's that's really what got me onto aging, reading, aging so papers. Does, so, so does this... Specifically in this preconditioning model with mito off, it doesn't work in old worms the so same way? So we didn't try the mito off, okay. but like the positive controls uh, don't work. Okay. So it's like, like the drug versions then, yeah. of, yeah. So you really get into uh, confusing territory when you're trying to. That's interesting. Into. I mean, do you, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but do you have a hypothesis for why that is in this specific context? The no. AMP kinase connection and any of that? I mean. I don't know. Yeah. Huh. I'm. It could be. Because, as you know, and as I worked on in your lab, that mitochondrial charge seems to decline with age. Right. So you're in sort, some context, you're so sort of already, as part of the aging process, getting that lower charge. So as a pretreatment, it's not going to do anything because you're already right. Because yes, it's it's the decreased. dynamic range is gone, and now yeah. the cells don't can't read it right. correctly. Right. Okay. Um, but you know, no data on that. But got it. Um, yeah. So that's what I started reading a lot of the aging literature around mitochondria, which is tons, um, and started to do a lifespan um, more and more and learning the right way to do it. Yeah. And Actually, I mean, I think that's that's probably worth just saying. I'd like Again, I know some of the people watching or listening are scientists doing experiments, and I mean, we see this a lot. I'm sure you've seen it a lot as well that, you know, there are a lot of papers published in C. elegans or fruit flies or yeast, especially because they're easy organisms to work with by labs that have never done aging before. And it's just, it's technically harder to do those experiments well than most people think. So you get a lot of not reproducible data in the literature, uh, 
from experiments that were not done carefully by people who ha don't have the experience, right? Yep. And I'll, I'll talk more about this in a future episode because it's one of my pet peeves. But one of the things that you often see is the controls, their lifespan is not what it should be. <laughs> Usually it's shorter from people who don't really haven't done, don't have a lot of experience. And so you'll get these sort of artificial results of lifespan extension. It's not really because the drug or the treatment extended lifespan is because the controls were very short lived because of conditions that maybe weren't optimized or something like that. So all of that's just to say that it doesn't surprise me to hear that you had to spend some time to learn how to do these experiments well before you could actually get data that was reproducible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, well, how the story goes is I, you know, learned how to do this, actually a cable line lab uh, paper on how to measure <laughs> lifespan in C. elegans um, was the protocol I used. I did the experiment, just illuminate the mito on worms throughout the entire lifespan. First time I did it, it looked like the mito on worms were living longer. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Did it again. It worked again. And I was like, I think that this might extend lifespan. And then I did it a bunch more and it didn't work. Hmm. And that's around where I left things and where I joined your lab and came out to the West Coast. And it wasn't working for a really long time until I got everything set up in the new lab with new reagents, a new wild type strain. So like all, controls are different. Everything is different. Um, and even the median lifespan was different than what I was getting elsewhere. This yeah. is a known thing. It's yeah. been written about a lot that reproducing lifespans is extremely variable. So we, we ended up reproducing it back in Rochester, ended up reproducing it. And then under uh, peer review, we actually, saw one of the reviewers went into the, each of the lifespan traces and pointed out that some of these are long lived and some of them are not really the most long lived. Like what is the reason for the variability? The replicates, you mean the replicates, yeah. right? And the reason ended up being small temperature changes, two degrees Celsius would really blunt the lifespan effect. If the worms got too warm, yeah. the experiment was over. Um, so yeah, just figuring out those details on top of the controls that you do. Um, yeah. And I mean, again, you know, I think this just points out the complex, the biological complexity and variability that we really don't understand and how, uh, you know, it, it's often difficult to know when you can't replicate results across labs, what, why that is the case, right? That it, I mean, it could be that the result is wrong or, you o or it only works under this one very specific condition, but it could also just be some some things like like this system, which is very complex. There are these subtle changes in something you wouldn't really expect to have an effect, like temp temperature, a couple of degrees, that are changing something maybe about the conformation of the protein or who knows, right? That is fundamentally changing the outcome of the experiment, and um, so it's often hard to know when you when when you get I mean, I think there's this, unfortunately, there's this tendency, people talk about the, you know, uh, uh, re reproducibility crisis, right? And it is true. A large number of experiments can't be replicated, but it's it's not always because the result was wrong or the, the person did something wrong. Sometimes it's because there's something subtle in the conditions that we don't understand, which actually is very frustrating <laughs> because... <laughs> For, for a few, it's obviously frustrating for the people doing the work. It's also frustrating, though, because it makes it very hard to know um, what's right and what's not, what's real and what's not. It also makes it very hard to disprove something. I think we see these results get in the literature sometimes that, you know, be in small circles become known that the original result was wrong. Um, but there's always this question. It's very hard to, to, to convince the broader community that the original result was wrong because people will say, well, maybe it was the temperature. Maybe it was the plastic you used, you know, all sorts of crazy yeah. stuff. So yeah. it's just, it's a really, un, it's, it's a reality of the situation, it's, you know, it's, but, uh, but it makes it hard. So I know that was a little bit of a tangent, but, um, but in this case, I think it's it's useful to illustrate that you really spent a lot of time trying to very precisely, first of all, make sure that it's real, 
uh, replicated as often as uh, as often as you needed to, or as many times as you needed to, to be confident, but also eventually actually figure out this very subtle factor that was influencing yep. the outcome of the experiment. Yep. Yeah, and it is an important tangent as well because for just science in general, I'm always, you know, one study is not proof yeah. of anything. Yeah. Um, you want multiple techniques to converge. Right. So. Yes, we showed with optogenetics that we were able to maybe oppose the decline in the mitochondrial charge that happens naturally with age, and that results in a significant lifespan extension for a population of worms. And that's because it's a new technology. It takes so many different factors. It's That's a very cool result, but like, what does it really mean? And then paper came out during a uh, postdoc that showed a drug that has a byproduct of increasing the mitochondrial charge in worms also what, what extended lifespan that? that's oligomycin yeah. so that kind of prevents atp production in mitochondria which kind of plugs up that hole which will let the membrane potential be higher right and that extended worm lifespan so that's kind of a different line of evidence to suggest that it it's not mito on that extends lifespan it's something about the charge yeah the which is also charge. interesting because you might think you know, just from your experiment that it's, it's maintaining the ATP that's what's causing the lifespan extension. I mean, sort of, you know, the intuitive answer would be, yeah, we're just keeping the battery charged, right? But, or the energy of the cell high. But what that oligomycin experiment says is it's probably not the ATP. That's right, yeah. Right, it's something about having a higher charge other than the ATP that's actually increasing lifespan, at least in worms. That's right, right. And... That to bring back AMP kinase, that experiment with the oligomycin the extending lifespan made me think this is not really about ATP, or m maybe it's still about ATP, but we can test that using the same AMP kinase mutant, which already had a long lifespan. So the idea was if you add mitoon to this worm with an active AMP kinase that we already know extends lifespan, right. you should get no more lifespan extension on top of that. And then we found that the lifespans did actually add together and yeah. we got a very long lived worm. Although let's let's dive a little bit into that because wouldn't you expect that that you would you would not expect mito on to turn on AMP kinase. Right. No, you would not. You, mito off turns on AMP right. kinase, right? So so why would you think that activation of AMP kinase would be mechanistically the same as mito on? Well, we thought, yes, so that's right. That originally we thought that using the knockout, so the dysfunctional version of AMP kinase would do this. So we did it in, in both of them. And really the surprising result was that in the active AMP kinase worm, we got additive yeah. lifespan extension, which we can't really explain. Yeah. Um, so still so it came from, yes, yeah, so <laughs> it, it came from that yeah. line of thinking, but yes, yeah, so it's, you know, biology is complicated, which is everyone can say that about Makes their fun. thing. Yeah. <laughs> Job security. Um, uh, so, do we know the mechanism for for why mitoon extends lifespan? I would say no. We don't know the mechanism at all. Um, and I think it's hard to know the mechanism, especially around mitochondrial membrane potential changes, because I, I call it a keystone of metabolism. It's one piece that coordinates both upstream metabolism, so how your food comes in to fuel the mitochondria, and how the cell responds to it through AMPK and other sensors. So I think people will be able to find many mechanisms where we could say, oh, it's AMP kinase, which we found out it's probably not, or, oh, it's, it's this protein, but that's because you looked at that protein. Yeah. I think finding the mechanism, I don't know if there is the mechanism, it's probably altering a lot of things, which it's the reverse of how we came at this. We're like, we want to isolate this variable so we know what this one variable has an effect on. And now I think we're learning that it has an effect on a lots lot of things. Lots and lots of stuff, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's often what you find with these these sort of central uh, features of cellular function, right? Right, yeah. Um, so I think one thought that people in the aging field would immediately gravitate towards is how does mitoon affect NAD homeostasis, right? So NAD, of course, is a central cofactor for almost all of the metabolic reactions that are feeding the mitochondria, so to speak. Do we know the answer to that? 
I don't think we know the answer to that um, very well. So in isolated mitochondria, we can do some tricks to affect oxygen consumption and the electron part of it. So that's the NAD, NADH part of it. In vivo, I think where we're not controlling the input and looking at the output, I think it's much less clear. Um, so you measure the most popular thing to measure about mitochondrial function is oxygen consumption. How, how much sure. are they respiring? Mito one didn't have an effect on oxygen consumption at all. No change in rate, no change in amount. Um, and at first we were thinking like, why doesn't it have an effect? But I think because we know how homeostatically the charge is regulated. I, yeah. I don't think it would have an effect on respiration. Has anybody ever looked at the, uh, the impact of, so, so, so Mito one, we don't know what that does to NAD homeostasis. Do you know if there's liter if there's NAD literature on what the effect of the sort of NAD precursors are on mitochondrial membrane potential? Yes, I know there's some conflicting data out there. <laughs> that's, that's the NAD literature in general. I shouldn't have even asked. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's complicated. So unclear. Okay, because you might you might I mean you might you, you could you could develop a hypothesis that mitoon is improving NAD homeostasis. Therefore, that's good in the context of aging. You could also develop a hypothesis that. NAD precursors are improving NAD homeostasis, which improves mitochondrial membrane potential, and that's why it's good, right? So, right, yep. Or they're completely independent of each other. Right. And just for the translational aspect of aging, NAD homeostasis without any optogenetic anything is different in different tissues. Sure. Worms have yeah. a few tissues. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so, yeah, I think it, it's really going to come down to using this tool to better understand very specific contexts rather than... We've, uh, we understand aging now. It's all mitochondrial membrane potential. Like that, I don't know. Right. So I don't think anybody has done what you did in worms in other organisms yet, right? In the context nope. of aging. So obviously that's right. one sort of fundamentally interesting question. If you had a mito on that you could use in a different organism, problem is most organisms aren't transparent, but if you had it, could you, would, is this conserved? I guess is right. the, the question. Right. What about the oligomycin experiment? Because that should be doable in fruit flies at least. Yeah, I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's data on that, really. Okay. I do know, similar to the oligomycin, there's some mouse data that using a mitochondrial antioxidant, so soaking up oxidants from mitochondria in... Is this, is this the SS peptide nope, stuff? Or? No, this is MitoQ. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So they gave this to, um, I think it was aged mice, yeah. and it resulted in increased mitochondrial membrane potential in hematopoietic cells and a younger transcriptional profile. So I think there's suggestive evidence out there from specific tissues that there is some conserved biology. I would really hesitate to make a prediction on if you had a transparent mouse and you have mito on in all the tissues in a transparent mouse and you perfectly replicated the worm experiment. I don't know what would I don't know if the worm, yeah, the mouse would be long lived or not. Right, yeah. Right. Um, but there is data suggesting that with age, you do see a decline in mitochondrial membrane potential in other organisms, at least yeah. in some tissues. Yes. Yep. Yep. And there's, it's more and more tissues all the time. It seems like um, now that it's becoming a little bit easier to measure mitochondrial membrane potential. But in vivo, like one of the first things that we talked about was, can we measure this in vivo in a person? And right. I think the answer is no, not really. Not in a really quantitative way. Um, it's it's pretty hard to measure it quantitatively. You need to control all of these things. Um, but as technology gets more advanced, I think it's getting easier for people to look at this. And um, I think some of it will be answered. Um, but yeah, it's hard to know. Okay. Um, okay, so then... I know you were working for a while on caloric restriction and its right. interaction with this phenomenon. Do you just want to tell us a little bit about what you found yeah. there? Yeah. So kind of the intervention um, to extend lifespan reproducibly is caloric restriction, decreasing the amount of calories consumed to still avoid malnutrition can give you pretty strong lifespan effects in all of these animals that we study. Um, so I wanted to know is that, because of mitochondria, which there's a bunch of evidence that it, mitochondria are involved in that. Sure. So specifically, is it the mitochondrial membrane potential? Um, so I looked at that in your lab, 
and as you know, had to troubleshoot uh, calorie restriction lifespans from scratch <laughs> and ran into all the same things. Sometimes it works and always use a positive control <laughs> to know that you're getting um, lifespan extension that you should be. Um, so yes, it turned out after lots of trying again that it seemed like reducing the amount of calories that the worms were eating as the worms aged when they would normally be losing mitochondrial charge, they were maintaining the charge. Right. So not necessarily increased from baseline, but a slower decline is what it looked like. And then we also used some mutants in different mitochondrial proteins to try to get at what parts of upstream or downstream metabolism could be fueling that and in from which direction. Um, but we saw that mitochondrial membrane potential did seem to be a factor in the lifespan extension from calorie restriction. Right. And if you prevent that maintenance of mitochondrial membrane potential under the caloric restricted state during aging, if you prevent that, that blocked That's right. the yeah. lifespan extension. Yeah. So something like DNP, we used FCCP to keep the make it so you can't increase the charge. Right. They did not get a lifespan extension. Right. I can't remember. I should remember, but I don't remember. <laughs> and it's hard in worms because as worms get old, the ability to do a lot of these experiments becomes more challenging. But did 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 we ever figure out whether once the membrane had declined with age, if you start the caloric restriction at that point, does it bring it back up? Or is it that you have to maintain it the whole time yeah i started developing those experiments and then and then they fell off and i left yeah okay so so, so yeah. tbd right yes. somebody should go do that experiment yeah would be the answer i mean in principle though you know that doesn't require the optogenetic tools that could be done also in other organisms right. and there might even be some data out there on right yeah but it's kind of an interesting um interesting question so there's at least a some reason to believe that this uh, pro-longevity effect of maintaining mitochondrial membrane potential is part of the story with caloric restriction. Do we have any data on other longevity interventions at this point or ideas about, is, in other words, is this a general phenomenon of longevity interventions or is it unique to caloric restriction or caloric restriction in a subset of things? Yeah, I think that there, there is some indication um, for other interventions. So like you mentioned metformin, yeah. which does a lot of different things. There's some evidence that metformin results in more and more charged mitochondria. Which is a little bit counterintuitive, right? It um, is, yeah. So that's in worms or other organisms? In other organisms as well. As well. Oh. In mice, like in mouse uh, skeletal muscle, at least. What happens is metformin will inhibit mitochondrial function yeah. in a lot of contexts. And the cell can respond to that by making more mitochondria to try to supersede the inhibition. Um, and those new mitochondria will have a better charge, at least for a while. Um, and then there's also some data in cells with rapamycin that uh, right. you can keep mitochondria charged longer in uh, replicative senescence, I think. So cells that have divided and divided and divided, they're losing mitochondrial function. Rapamycin can keep them online a little bit longer. Um, so I think that it's a general phenomenon. And that's why mitochondrial dysfunction is a hallmark of aging. Yeah. Um, they're all interconnected. And right. we wrote an article about how mitochondria right. are connected right. to in every fact, one there's, of them. There's a figure in there. So the hallmark wheel with mitochondrial dysfunction and then causing all the other hallmarks, right? So, yeah. I mean, you, you can make the same argument about epigenetic changes and, and other hallmarks, but they are interconnected. Yeah. So that figure, though, which you made, not me, actually, I think I maybe made that, um, uh, would suggest that if you could prevent mitochondrial dysfunction, you cure aging. Do you believe that? No. <laughs> <laughs> me either. No. No, I don't believe I wish that. it was that simple. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, mitochondria have been living within us for billions of years yeah. and they're dependent on us as much as we are on them is how I like to phrase it. Okay. So, so fixing mitochondrial dysfunction does not cure aging, but do you think mitochondrial dysfunction is the most important hallmark? <laughs> what is important? Yeah. Mean <laughs> is it your that? favorite hallmark? It's How's my that? favorite okay, hallmark. We'll it's, go with that. It's my favorite hallmark. <laughs> <laughs> what is the idea behind, I mean, I think there's lots of things you can do with these optogenetic 
tools and particularly the mitochondrial optogenetic tools, but but what are some of the applications in, in sort of a therapeutic setting, which I'm guessing is what they're trying to do? I've always been a proponent of this stuff as a scientific tool, a way to isolate variables, to understand how mitochondria are functioning, and then intervene in a more informed way yeah. with other stuff. I do think that there are there are some applications where where you can get light into the tissue that you know gene therapy is becoming it's is up and coming yeah so maybe but what about in agriculture though because it seems like there may be applications in in agriculture yeah yeah technology. already organism that already uses light um yeah i think that that's hmm. ripe for the picking and um although again it just requires some plant biologists yeah to, right <laughs> to get on it <laughs> All right, cool. I was going to ask if you think at some point we're going to have gene therapy to implant this in people. Because I know there's a lot of people listening who probably would. Yeah, do I don't know. <laughs> I mean, maybe the technology will be there. I mean, one the question day. is again, you know, you could do it in skin beyond the, the, beyond the parts of our bodies that are exposed to light. It's sort of, it's not obvious to me what you would, what the benefits would be of doing that. Right. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm right there as well. I don't. I think there's so much potential for this scientifically that I don't really think too much about it beyond that. Um, because I think we have ways just by better understanding the mitochondrial charge, there might be ways much more low tech ways to target that or to redesign strategies to target it with what we already have. Right. So, you know, why do gene therapy when we could just realize, Oh, this drug will work now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for uh, for joining us. Um, I hope you all found this uh, interesting and stimulating. Um, as always, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them uh, below. And I hope to see you next time on the OptiSpan podcast.